Black lights and booze burn when I record for watch And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot All black everything, everything black Culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back Welcome to Left the Block. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal, and we are joined by Carla F.C. Holloway for a return engagement to Left the Black. Carla F.C. Holloway is the James B. Duke Professor Emerita huh? of English and Law at Duke University, where her research and teaching have included African-American literary and cultural studies, bioethics, gender and law. She's the author of many books, but today we're talking about Carla Holloway, the fiction writer. <laughs> a Death in Harlem, a novel was published in 2019. And today we're here to talk about her new novel, Gone Missing in Harlem. Ravi Howard, the author of Driving the King, writes, with an evocative mix of questions and revelations, Gone Missing in Harlem chose a vivid sense of the lost and found. Carla F.C. Holloway again gives us the rich layers of Weldon Thomas's detective work, migration, abduction, and striving create the sense of wonder that fuels this resonant novel. Oh, so great to see you! It's uh, just wonderful Carla to Holloway. be here. My, thank my, you for having me. My, nice my for, to be back. <laughs> thank you, my, my forever dean, <laughs> as I like I to it. refer you to you. Evergreen, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> And, and it's so great uh, to see you, particularly in the midst of everything that we've been going through okay. this last year. Uh, so it's good to see you healthy and thriving as, Thank as always. Thank you kindly. But this new novel, Gone Missing in Harlem, and, you know, you, you introduced us in A Death in Harlem to this character, Welding Haney Thomas. And, and, we'll, <laughs> and we'll talk about Detective Thomas in a second. But the first thing that comes to mind to me is, is the rich legacy of the work of Chester Himes. Yes. Right. Who we knew as a great groundbreaking fiction writer. And of course, you know, he wrote an extraordinary autobiography. Now the quality but most of folks, her. yes. But, but most of us knew of Chester Himes, right? When we weren't sitting in the academy and in, in English mm -hmm. lit classes, we knew him because of his detectives. That's right. Grave Digger Jones and Coffin Ed Johnson. Mm -hmm who were translated to us, thanks to Ozzie Davis and others, to the big screen. Prognosis negative. Assault with intent to kill. If she dies, it's a murder one. Which means we burn you. And Cotton comes to Harlem and, and welcome and come back Charleston Blue in the early 1970s. Talk a little bit about your inspiration for creating this detective character well, that would take I'm us here. through this world. <laughs> I'm here because they were there. You know, that's that's the only way I think that I could have imagined myself in this, which I have come to learn as a genre. I really, as a fiction writer, had to learn, oh, people are going to call you a historical novelist or a detective or what kind of novelist? I'm just writing. But I realized <laughs> that my forebears there, my most immediate, Walter Mosley's up in there, but you're right to put it right there with Chester Himes because he wrote broadly. He wrote mm -hmm. something like the quality of hurt that will bring tears to my eyes even today. And then, you know, creating characters like um, Grave Digger Jones, you know, just the <laughs> idea of um, being able to see his universe as yeah. that broad. So it's that more than anything else. Um, the detective, comes from a number of places for me. The permission comes from Chester Himes. Yeah, that's great to think about it. And, and of Weldon Haney Thomas, um, you know, the choices of names are deliberate. And, and, yes, and, we'll, yes, they and, are. We'll, and we'll talk about the we'll talk about the Haney in this in a moment. <laughs> oh, we um, will? Okay. But but I do want to talk about the Weldon. Um because yeah. the first thing that comes to mind when I think about you know one of the most gifted chroniclers. Mm -hmm of that early period in Harlem of the 20th century of black life, the first name I think of is James Weldon Johnson. Yeah. Um, and so I want to get a sense of how deliberate you were in the naming of the character as, as a signpost to these other incredible figures who existed in that moment. This is why I love the chance to talk to you, Mark, because you get it all. You even taught me what it what the, I was doing in terms of putting Easter eggs. In the book. <laughs> I didn't even know what I was doing. You said, those are called Easter eggs, Carla, but James um, Weldon Haney is an Easter egg because I remember 
being in Harlem and in New York looking for James Lovin Johnson's burial place and the store when I was writing Passed On and looking for famous African-Americans burial sites and the stories around that. Um, he was on the, he has a plaque on the ground, literally one of those plaques that, you know, not, not a gravestone, but a plaque. And I was thinking, yep, grounded right there with Weldon. He's in the earth. <laughs> you know, so when, but one thing, you know, to be quite honest is I wanted some old school names. And since I'm yeah, right there right. at old school, that <laughs> kind of name was totally familiar to me. <laughs> yeah. So it was easy to call him Weldon um, and easy to see him as, you know, he's, he's a person who reads enormously, who has books surrounding him. And so that dimension of this detective, an informed man, was certainly connected to James Weldon Johnson's own habits of reading and being situated in the folk. Um, so he's there. <laughs> And Haney, I couldn't help to think of our, our colleague and dear friend, Kerry Haney. And, yeah. and Detective Thomas, you know, has a kind of, it, the bottom line for him is always the truth of the story. That's it. No matter what his passions were. And I can't read that character without seeing I'm so or glad. hearing Kerry Haney, right? Because that's the thing, you know, incredible passions, right? Well, you but know, ultimately the, fueled by this desire mm -hmm. to find the truth of the, the truth. And, and, and to dig until you get it and you don't care where you have to go, but, <laughs> but you know how to behave in different places when you're there. Right, if I'm up there right. with the Sadidi place, I'm gonna be more Sadidi than you are. You know? <laughs> and what did you say you did after that? You know? um, and if I'm down there in the streets, I'm gonna talk with you like you in the streets and knowing when to hush right. and listen. And that's right. one of the things from our shared friend. He is a great listener Absolutely. and he absorbs information and, and, he's, and he's folk too. Right. You know? he, right. he can talk right. to right. Antibody. Yeah. So I wanted Weldon to have that characteristic to not be to not let the uniform um, make him distant. Although I was real aware when he first came, you know, to fruition in a death in Harlem. Carla, you're writing about the black police. You know, what are you doing writing about the black police? Um, because he wasn't a detective; he was a policeman. He you know, literally could not have been a detective. Although there is a black detective um, actually born in North Carolina, who was New York City's first um, colored policeman. His name was Samuel Battle, and he eventually did become a detective. But I didn't know his story much until after I had written the book. But what I did know is this was a policeman who was doing it as his preacher told him, you know, these people, your work, they're not your people. And I wanted um, a person who would always believe the people he was, the people in the station house, that he would not identify so with them as we have seen folk do once you give them the uniform or the outfit or the cap and gown or whatever, you know, they sort of lose themselves. Well, I didn't want anybody who would lose themselves. And so Weldon Haney, he's not gonna get lost. He's gonna help <laughs> a few things get found. We're here with, Carla Holloway talking about her new novel, Gone Missing in Harlem. And, you know, as with The Death in Harlem, you know, this is a book that centers obviously on that incredible space in New York that, that is so critical to our sense of Black excellence, if you will. But that historical period, right? What is it for you about this post-World War I Black migration period? you know, really that 12 to 13 year period. Um, what is it for you that brings you back to that period of time to tell these stories? I'm one generation removed from that period. Hmm. So the stories I heard were from folk who were living that story, who actually left Selma, Alabama and went to Detroit 
in New York City and Buffalo, New York, where, you know, I grew up. Mm -hmm. And so the stories that I know about that are absolutely firsthand. You know, they're about don't turn around. Johnny Law is following us or having to sit (laughs) on the, you know, sit in the stay in the car overnight because we wouldn't get accommodations when we're going back and forth south to visit family or the family who came north and especially my family who came to Harlem, um, whom I visited during the summers and who struggled there. And so I didn't want the story to be so removed to be like, um, am I thinking of those Bridgerton stories, you know, (laughs) Dutch and stuff like that. that, That's a bit, bit too far away and too imaginative for me. But I did want them to be out of touch so I would have to be creative and imagining, but I did want them to be credible. And for me, not only do some of these folks have um, names of people in my family who will be surprised when they read the book. (laughs) Uh, I haven't let them know, but we had some good old school names. So they just kind of show up in the book. But then North Carolina shows up in the book, this family, in Gone Missing in Harlem comes from Sedalia, which is when I moved to North Carolina, I found out my family was enslaved in Guilford County. Wow. And they're still living in Sedalia. And I had an uncle who taught at North Carolina Central. And wow. so, and my great grandfather went to Palmer Memorial Institute. So when I bring up Palmer and Bennett College in the book, I have their diplomas on my wall here, one shot signed by Charlotte Hawkins of my great grandfather. And the next, that was lower school. And the next one is signed by Charlotte Hawkins Brown. Because in between there, she found Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown eventually <laughs> left, but yeah, I've, I've got the record on my wall. So these folks are my people and I felt them like kin. Um, But I also felt there were stories I was protected from. Mm -hmm. And that's some of some of what's different, I think, between Gone Missing and A Death in Harlem. The thing about both novels, um, the the level of detail that you present, you know, to things about Black life. First of all, that only Black people would know. (laughs) (laughs) Um, yeah. but, but I was struck by a couple <laughs> um, in in Gone Missing. Um, one, the stories of the migrants moving to to Harlem, right? And you know, mm-hmm. for for those who don't know or, or don't remember, you know, Harlem is a community of stoops. That's right. You know, tenured buildings with these stoops that sit out front. You know, some of them beautiful when we talk about Strivers mm-hmm. Row, but right. for, you know, for most of these buildings, you know, tenement buildings, and the stoop became the porch. That's right. That's know, the front folks. porch, <laughs> right? Really and, and you and you talk about the folks who seem to, to the young folks, right, who seem to be on the street all the time, mm-hmm. right? But but weren't a threat to people who were in their homes, so they left the doors cracked, right, yeah. to make sure there was a flow of air. I'm and, so glad and, you noticed that. And, and there was always a moment where you're like, you know, come help me put these groceries away. Um, and, and I recall mm-hmm. stories that I didn't understand when I was a kid growing up in the Bronx or visiting family in Harlem, you know, the way, you know, there were always guys who were on the street, right? But they were never dangerous, right? And and, and when your mother or your grandmother or your auntie was coming home for work, (laughs) right, on a daily basis, these were folks who- available. Right. These were folks who protected them to make sure that no one bothered them because that was Mrs. So-and-so and and auntie so-and-so. And and, and those women understood, like, on payday, let me get him a can of beer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, that's, you know? I didn't want these people to think of themselves as threats or be perceived as threats. And I know that that's so what you left the door cracked, you know? Um, and I think at one point I said, it would have taken the ironing board out there if they could, you know, <laughs> get some fresh air because the tenements. And I remember these long, narrow halls that we yeah. went where my uncle and yeah. aunt lived and having to go th- in dark, Right. You know, and so whatever light you could bring in them. But then I was also thinking 
these folks just came up from home, from, from Sedalia, mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. um, Durham, and were used to outdoors scents and freshness. And they were, in a sense, locked into these spaces. How did they make them friendly? Um, what, did they, what did they do to create right. neighbor and family? So I'm glad you know. I, the details of the story, whether I was talking about somebody's sewing basket or pockets, or um, were important to me because those are, for me, this is a very visual and tactile book. Yep. You know, I, right. I kept, I, when I was writing, I would, you know, come out and do my hands like this. So what's in these pockets? You know, <laughs> and, yeah. Um, <laughs> what's she feeling? You know, what does that cloth feel like? So I don't know where that came from, because I swear I didn't write any of that in that nonfiction I wrote when I was <laughs> on the tenure track. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I didn't care what anything felt like, except when somebody publish it, please. <laughs> you know, but here you're sort of left to feel it's a, a felt life. Um, yeah. And I told somebody this book is more alto than um, Gone Missing, than A Death in Harlem, because it has more seriousness that I had to pull editors away from saying this is a tragic story of, you know, you know, doldrums. And what I said, what book did you read? <laughs> These are resilient people, but I really <laughs> had to have that argument because I realized some were reading it to see the, the difficulties. And I wrote it to show what strength and hope and resolve folk had, despite the circumstance, but I'm about ready um, to realize that it's going to be read differently. And that's one thing I really had to learn that you write it, you let it go. And the only way you can come at people is through Twitter and that would not be a good idea. <laughs> I, I'm also thinking about the story. And if I recall, the character's name is June Bug. June Bug. Um, it, itself a whole nother story. But the incident that necessitates his family moving from North Carolina to Harlem. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the thing that I know you heard when you were a child that I heard when I was a child about children being seen but not heard. Right. Right. And, and so that's that one piece of the parenting part. But also, what do you do with observant, precocious Brilliant children. Brilliant children. Right, right. Who, who can see the madness of the reality, even at seven years old, you know, as is the case with Junebug, mm -hmm. and trying to find the fine balance, right, yeah. of nurturing their genius and their brilliance, mm -hmm. but also protecting them, right? And, and I'm it's talking to a woman. Shielding the joy. Right. And, and I'm talking now to a woman who's that. raised a scientist. <laughs> 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 no. <laughs> and we're going to be honest about <laughs> these things. And well, but, but, you, but I you're also, if we're going to tell the truth, we got to, who raised two children, one right. who is a scientist and one who didn't make it. Right. And so I'm keenly aware of the, the, the differences dynamics. and the dynamics yeah. there. But Easter egg, um, C. Eric Lincoln's coming through the fire. That's the source of this memory. Although you're right there, you know, we know these stories of having yeah. to be protective, but C. Eric Lincoln tells a edge of a story about him counting out change for his father in the store and getting admonished for it because he corrected the shopkeeper. And that stage, Sierra Lincoln, the great religious scholar who was a Duke right. scholar, one of the right. first person I met with John Hope, uh, when he read that story out loud um, in Gothic bookshop, that's what it's called on campus, that sort of stayed with me because it's a story my father told, it's a story my grandfather told, you know, don't, cor <laughs> don't correct white folks. You know? right. Do you want what I loved about that section, though, was the gathering of men around the boy and his father, realizing what had happened after the little seven-year-old corrects the, um, the shopkeeper and the men saying, we got to right. step, step <laughs> into this. I mean, it's great. It's like folks who looked around, first of all, to see who heard it uh -huh. <laughs> and, who, and who was white. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, and that 
early what you said earlier about protecting that protecting was going on south and north so these children who were bright and precocious and i think i say in that point that the real problem was when he giggled over the man's mistake and i said that's critical error there you know he's laughing that white man don't know nothing daddy he got your money wrong he owes you this you know and then the men sort of I, I could hear their grumbling and saying, but the pitiful part of that story is that they had to diminish him in order to save him. Right. So they had to say, that boy is touched. You know, he always went a little right. bit weird. You know, he's strange, special. peculiar right. since day one, I think that chapter is. And that's the irony that I think the book plays back and forth with. We have to shield our children by diminishing them yeah. in order, you know, what kind of world? Thanks for noticing that. Right. Like a death in Harlem, um, gone missing in Harlem, you know, presents to us the duality of black life, right? The two worlds where things happen in black life that don't mm-hmm. register in the white world and in the white world, those same experiences dominate our understanding. And, and for you, it's the reality of this baby that's gone missing in comparison to the Lindbergh baby, right? right. Which, which was a national obsession. It was. Right? It, obsession it, and, is the right word. And, and really set in motion, you know, this ongoing for almost another century, obsession with missing white folks, particularly young white girls. Yep, yep. Um, talk a little bit about how important it was for you to talk about the duality to these kinds of experiences, right? The, the lack of value to Black life. Absolutely um, critical that if I were to, you know, I have to list and the things that motivated this was, and one was the value of our children and the value when they go missing, um, as opposed to attached to, and then, and then I went, you know, hog wild and said, like the Lindbergh baby, you know, like the, the, the comparison, but that was a national, books have been written, manuscripts, tomes have been written about this baby um, who was kidnapped and found dead. And I actually oddly enjoyed writing the, with clarity, exactly what happened with the Lindbergh, because that's, that's a factual part of of a historical novel. So approaching that and then being able to pull out little pieces of, so when Harlem gets wind of that, First thing is, what, the, well, what about one of our babies? You know, right. what are they right. worth? You know, and again, I don't know why I keep thinking about Ernest Gaines as a gathering of old men, but I keep thinking about gatherings of people in this book who gather around like the Greek chorus and pronounce, right. you know, wait a minute, one of ours went missing last. What are we going to do about this? Where's the FBNI? You know, I could hear these men (laughs) talking and one of the somebody says baby doesn't have a father. And I say, yep, price drop. You know, I could just hear people's judgments as well as their worry. And that's the odd thing, the paradox that as much as we are going to mourn and live by that comparison, we are also going to be tainted by the way the story will unfold in one community versus ours. And we're the intermediary. Um, so Weldon comes in to give value back, you know, his, his presence as sure and stable as he is, um, uniform and all. I think, yeah, yeah, get our policeman, you know, he'll do the job that the FBI and I are yeah. not gonna do. Right. Let me change direction a little bit. Um, You know, a a death in Harlem, you know, it's juxtaposed to a murder that occurs at the intersection of the black world and the white world, right? Mm -hmm. The the, the death that occurs in Ella Larson's passing. Yeah. Um, And I'm thinking about the fact, and I don't know if you had a chance to see it yet. You know, I I had the opportunity to screen the new film depiction of of passing. No, Um, I haven't yet. 
at, yeah. at, at, at Sundance, you no, know, with Ruth Nigga and minute, Tessa wait Thompson. Wait a minute, Did I just hear you say <laughs> at Sundance? I had the opportunity to. Scream. Well, you know that, that was a, a, that that I'm writing that's to the, the New York Times. Go ahead. I, I mean, but that's the beauty. It, it, you know, if there's any small slither of of, you. of wonderful things in this moment, you know. It's that folks had to shift in the way that they delivered content, right? Mm -hmm. So not having to fly but, to Utah. But you were on the list. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway. <laughs> okay, all right, I'll let you. But, um, you know, the, the story of passing, of course, is about mixed race babies. Yes. Um, uh, the, or the potential moment. of mixed race babies, right? And, and so it brings us to this interesting moment, Ooh. right? You know, this this question of, on the one hand, well, obviously we're talking about Meghan and Harry, uh -huh. this moment of of someone, you know, in, in the royal household, you know, raising a question about what color the baby is going to be, right? And, and I also, baby Archie in this case, but, but also seeing commentary on Twitter amongst Black folks who had had their own experiences with you know, babies that were born and did, did you check behind the ear? Ears, you know, what, you know? What's the grade mm -hmm. of hair like? What's the, what's the thing? <laughs> <laughs> so talk a little bit about this interesting moment where, you know, in some ways the white world is introduced to a conversation. And they got to come to black, us for what it means. For expertise, yes. <laughs> you know, right. Um, there's a point in this story, which I, you know, I laughed writing it, but it's like laughing at your own jokes where the baby who is missing is a mixed race baby. And the kidnapper, you know, approaches the baby, looks at the babies, oh, that can't be the one, that's a white baby. <laughs> <laughs> right. And then he goes home and tells his wife, couldn't find the baby to kidnap because there's only a white baby. He said, fool, because she worked in a nursing hospital and she knew. Right. Yeah, she knew. But, right. So it's the same, I think they call it a conceit that I played with in, um, <laughs> Uh, death in Harlem, that this idea of, you know, the things that still mysterious to you white folks is you right. sometimes don't know right. when right. we are amongst you. And these are the great, you know, when is somebody going to make the movie of the Rhinelander story, you know, yeah, where right, right. Um, you're not quite sure, are they black? Are they white? Are they in our mix? That's why the people who, the Black women who worked in white households were noticeably black. They didn't mind anybody they couldn't understand. But these right, folks right. that when they could not answer the question, the mystery of color is cropping up now. And I'm just saying, hello, people. I wrote some books about this you know, um, because it is it's a device that is not only um, strategic, but it's thick in terms of its storytelling potential. So one of the questions in, you know, Gone Missing in Harlem is everybody in an uproar because this baby's so pretty, you know, um, or would they have been the same if it had been a brown skin baby? Right. Yesterday I, I started just the edge of a hashtag on Twitter, colorism in the family. You know, when, <laughs> when, when did somebody ask you? And, and to be frank, I said that I remember my first boyfriend that I brought home from college to Detroit to a grandparent who had come up from Selma. And she looked at him and said, Carly, he's a little bit dark, you know, and... You know, that was not the man I married. And in one sense, it's a blessing that she had passed on by the time I did bring home the one I was going to marry, because I don't know if my grandmother could have handled it. But we were supposed to marry up, you right. know, marry light. Um, and my father literally talked to me about this. And he forgot that I was in the back seat of the car. My two sisters, I'm a middle child, on either side of me were lighter skinned. My mother was very light skinned. And one day he's just driving along saying, yep, I was always sure I was going to marry me a light skinned girl with good hair. And I'm in the backseat looking at my sister and say, daddy, you no, know, I'm, I'm, I'm back seat, here. Right? <laughs> <You know? laughs> and it did not even occur to him what he was saying. What occurs to me now is I remember that. Um, I remember my father with love and pride. And I also remember where his values lay. So I did want to write about the thick stories that come out of colorism um, with Nella Larson's passing, with my version of it um, in, in A Death in Harlem, where, you know, do you belong or don't you belong? Um, you belong better if you're light-skinned, skinned, did, skin did 
versus versus brown. Right. Um, and it's that thing I grew up with. If you black, get back. If you brown, stick around. If you're white, well, you are right. I we would say <laughs> today, yeah. I guess. Right. Um, that that's this is a storytelling space for me, I guess I would say colorism is. And what's going on now? What I wanted to suggest in my tweet is for a, a lot of us, there's no surprise here. Of course right. they ask that, you know. Of course, I remember when um the Duchess first walked out with the baby and the baby was kind of bunted. And some photographer said, well, can we see it closer? <laughs> and I, I might have tweeted that too. You know what they're looking for. Oh, or, um, but they didn't right. know that they had to wait a little while until the color came in. <laughs> so that race secret, it plays right. into this story about them not being smart enough to know a black baby when they see one because we could be all over the place and you might not know. I, I know you're not surprised by anything that came out in that interview with Oprah. Um, were you surprised with the amount of attention that it has generated? No, because we are in a period of strategic and um, thick denial mm -hmm. about racism. Um, I was reading this morning about the Eyes of Texas song. Is it racist? Or, well, it was just at a minstrel show. General Lee didn't really say it. <laughs> you know, and, it so, doesn't you know, matter. Right? Yeah. Shades <laughs> of, you know, how racist does it have to be before you remove the statue? Um, if you remove the statue instead of changing the institution, is that okay? <laughs> you right. know, so, right. um, and I think this is all due to the, you know, blessing and curse of having had the first Black president. Right. Um, the consequence of that first Black president we lived with for the last four years. And the irony now, in my judgment, that President Biden will be able to do a heck of a lot more than President Obama was because he's a white man. Yeah. You know? um, so this idea that race dialogue has changed, once you get into it, it gets old and familiar so quick. You know, there's nothing new and, oh, well, I didn't know that about race. That changes my perception. <laughs> you go back and say, well, how much, I mean, 23 and Me, the genomics, you know, the, right. the newest science are just going to tell you how black you are. You know, right. are you quadroon or mulatto? <laughs> are you octoroon or quintroon? You know, it's just the same old same, you know. Um, um, no, I'm not surprised. I'm personally deeply hurt because I'm 71. And I think a younger self would have anticipated that I could see our way out of this by this decade of my life. If not the resolution, just the way out. And I don't see our way out. Um, I see too much denial too much fear over th this nonsense about the problem is you called me a racist, not what you did. It's that right. horrible. Or what you said, right. right. You know, when we lose control of the language as a language person, I said, that's, that's when you're all in it's trouble. A, it's a wrap. And yeah. I'm, I'm just hurt by this. So I think that's one reason I'm writing fiction now, Mark. I wrote my academic books about race and law and race and, you know, ethics and race and literature. I said, let me just lie for a while because, you know, at least maybe during these, these years, I can take mm -hmm. some refuge mm -hmm. in story. Let me ask you this question, but before I let you go, um, you know, if I go back 10 years of the past, um, and I'm thinking about this new micro blogging platform called Twitter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it, and if I looked around the table at my colleagues here at Duke, <laughs> it, the last go. two people that I would have expected that would have such a digital footprint there would have been our colleague Sandy Darity. Uh huh. And, uh -huh. and it would and it would have been you, right? And, and and it just fundamentally surprises me about the presence that you have on Twitter, right? And now why and, is that, Mark? 
I, I mean, well, no, why is it that you would have been surprised? I am too, but I just want to hear. I think, I, you know, I think you were very skeptical and suspicious of cer- certain forms of public intellectual work. Yeah. And, and some of that had to do with representations of pub- Black public intellectuals. So yep. I, I get you're that right. piece of it. You're right. I know what you're um, not saying. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and that was, you know, because there, there's a way that even now, you know, there are colleagues of ours who think of the activity there as frivolous. Yeah. That there's not really engaged in the kind of interventions that can be made intellectually and, mm-hmm. and politically in all other kinds of ways. Uh, but you are at this moment now. And, and I think about your colleague at the University of Virginia. Uh, and, and then I think about Dion Warwick, right? And, oh, and, bless. And, oh. And, and, and you all <laughs> are among the, the Black aunties. I love it. Of, I of Twitter. And, and, and so, you know, how does it feel to be a Black auntie at Twitter, right? You know, one yeah. of the ways, because one of the things I love, um, your both your institutional novel, your institutional knowledge of the institution that we've long given our labor to. Mm-hmm. Right, but the expertise that has come with your navigating the academy, and, and the way you can just drop, you know, two hundred and twenty characters, not <laughs> even the full two forty, right, and and just blow up, you know, well, what folks don't understand about yeah. what this is. I think one time last week I said, "Don't mess with me. I know stuff. Don't make right. don't make me come come out of here." <laughs> um, here, one of the good things that's happened is I have no accountability to anybody but my family now, which is extremely important to me. So you notice that if I happen to make a mistake and post a picture of my grand boy, it's deleted right away because right. I know she's going to come after me. <laughs> um, so I try to keep their privacy intact. But one day I was tweeting when the governor was talking about age ranges in the vaccine. Well, I've written enough in my academic life about black mortality to know we might not get to be age 75. Right. What do you mean right. starting this vaccine at 75? Right. And I'm hoping that some of my tweets right after I started sending the secretary of health, the black mortality tables in North Carolina in my tweet, suddenly something, you know, the, the age <laughs> range shift. came yeah. down, you know, now it might not have been me, but, you know, I'm going to claim everything I can. In these <laughs> days. Um, and plus, then I got, could get my vaccine too. But, you know, the, the way that people can get away with nonsense or not being thorough, um, that you couldn't always say from a seat at the table, you can mm-hmm. say from behind the keyboard. And so it's like these things I never, I might have said more than I think on diversity initiatives, you know, but I was sitting at the table saying them. Now I'll just tell people, you know, that money you're spending on that diversity officer, why don't you do some programs? And I don't mean programming. I don't mean a speaker for Black History Month. I mean, change a program, you know, endow a program. The Things that bring institutions the most notice these days are scholarship, run, race, ethnicity, culture, and gender. Have y'all noticed? Don't make me tweet about it. So, right. I, I mean, because one of the things I've particularly learned from you that, and I learned from you when you were at Duke and, and even now, um, but you know, we create these employment interventions mm-hmm. that serve the needs of an institution at a particular moment but don't really position people to be able to further their career once they are out of that position, right? Right. So all these institutions, like, you know, we want to do anti-racist scholars, right? Are these positions going to help them be able to advance their career so that they're legible to their fields of research when they leave this institution? Here's my thing. Tell me how many diversity, equity, and inclusion um, vice provosts and vice presidents have become presidents of institutions. Right. Right. You know, or we know provost, these right. associate provosts and things are, you know, stair steps to the next position. You don't find that in these jobs and you find it for a reason, you know, now, come on, folks, let's stop fooling ourselves, you know, so you do make you know, literally Band-Aid solutions. But I see, I think I would, skeptical, yes, on of digital platforms, I would have said also cautious because I, I do worry. Um, every time I see a professor, a brother professor posting a picture from a bathroom about his abs, I, was, I might I might have written a few a note. 
you know, because, you know, I, I can DM and I said, you know, you might, you might not want to do that right now. And I've usually been right, you know. So <laughs> there are times when I do the caution I am concerned about because I don't trust the way this discourse is being used institutionally and selectively. I can do it because I'm an auntie and free. Right. Um, Tenured folk can probably do it. Untenured should still think about what we always thought about it as you and I write, who's your audience? You know, and your audience are people who will embrace you and people who will try extremely hard to bring you down. And if nothing else will hurt your spirit. And something's worth protecting these days. That's one of the things about Gone Missing. Um, I think it's a book about spirit. And I think about the harms that, are, that I write about that surprised me that I wrote about in this story are all um, salved by the emergence of spirit. And that's, as our colleague who is now at that Northern Institution Rutgers would say, salvific. That's the word I learned from <laughs> Professor Wallace. I like to say that's salvific, you know. So, and the important thing about Gone Missing, these folks came back home at right. the end of the without giving the story away because it is a mystery right. and it's hard to talk about. But they right. did come back south, and that does mark our own movement, our own migrations, because the, these great migration generations and their children you know, started returning south. Now, what's that all about? You know, ask E.S.A. Lehman, ask Ravi Howard, ask right. folks who are back working in the south. Um, Tressie, yeah, you know, mm -hmm. we're home for a reason. Yeah. I, I do worry about our young folks. Some, um, you know, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and sometimes in the kind of... Uh, infrastructure that Twitter is in terms of affirmation, mm -hmm. it, it's hard to hear people when they're telling you what you don't know. Yes, <laughs> it is. That's what, that's, that's why I use, I do a lot of DMing. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and even when I see people struggling with things, sometimes, you know, what I've learned from my own very much to public, I did not have any choice struggles was, you know, You've got to keep a piece of yourself safe yeah. from yeah. that, um, from, from, from availability. You've got to shield your own spirit because ain't nobody going to do it with you. You know, are you sure, sweetheart, you want to be well? Because, you know, healing's no trifling matter, Tony K. wrote in Salt Eaters. So I didn't want to write about trifling things, but I also wanted to celebrate our resilience. Well, Carla Holloway, we are so thankful that you were willing to share some of yourself and your brilliance with Left of Black. Um, <laughs> thank you. I am so grateful the, for Left of Black. Well, thank you. Uh, the author of the brand new novel, Gone Missing in Harlem. Gone Missing in Harlem. <laughs> Baby carriage, scissors. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Carla, for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for the excellent institutional work. See, folks, this is what it looks like, institutional work. Thank you for the institutional work you are doing. Um, it will benefit like ripples on a pond, as Nikki Giovanni would say. Yes. Thank you, Carla. Thanks, everybody. Black lights and booze burn when I record for Watts and every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot. All black everything, everything black, culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back, black.